particular food or a particular nutrient out of the diet. So they continued, I guess, to do some studies to do with the body being in ketosis. Um, and the production of ketone bodies. So, Hi everybody, welcome back to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I'm joined again today by an amazing Emily Carhill. Emily is a cardiovascular nurse. She has a special interest in oncology. She's a naturopath and she's also a uh, very valid member of the Kidney Coach team. First off, Emily, do you wanna walk us through what polycystic kidney disease is? How would someone know that they've got that? The symptoms, the etiology of the disease and just Anything else you think we need to know about what polycystic kidney disease is? Sure. So polycystic, polycystic kidney disease is <laughs> a genetic disease that causes um, cysts to grow on the kidneys. So cysts um, over time can increase in number and increase in size. And if that happens, then basically it's like they're taking up uh, parts of the kidney so they're, they're taking up normal kidney tissue which means that eventually the kidneys can't work as well because they've got these cysts in place of their normal tissue. Um, uh, generally the kidneys will also increase in size with the cysts so kidneys can end up weighing you know quite a lot more than than what they normally would because of this which can then come with some pain and things like that. Generally there's two different types of polycystic kidney disease. One is that uh, mostly children are diagnosed with, um, or it could even be picked up prior to um, prior to birth. Uh, but the more common one is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which generally doesn't get picked up till someone sort of in their 30s or 40s. Mm. Um, symptom wise can be pain. So pain, particularly in the back or um, your sides, just sort of where your kidneys are. High blood pressure is a really, really common one. Um, so particularly when younger people have developed high blood pressure, that's usually a bit of a red flag uh, that, that kidneys are something that should be looked at. And then, you know, other, I guess, symptoms of kidney disease, so blood in urine, um, uh, having frothy urine, so protein, um, and also having a bigger tummy as well. And that's part of how big the kidneys can get. So why don't you tell us about some of that great research that's coming out about fasting and its impact on uh, cyst formation? Yeah, so they um, were doing studies in, in animals with polycystic kidney disease and, and sort of trialing, trialing different things. And they started off just by reducing food intake. So they reduced the amount of food that they were, um, they had available anywhere between 10 and 40 percent depending on the study and they were finding that that was reducing the number of cysts, the reducing the size of cysts, reducing scarring of the kidneys, reducing inflammation um, and all of these good things and so at that stage they weren't quite sure exactly why it was happening, um, whether it was reducing a particular food or a particular nutrient out of the diet so they continued I guess to do some studies and they also had a look at intermittent fasting um, and specifically time restricted eating mm -hmm. as well, which seem to have the same benefits as just complete um, calorie restriction in, in the animals as well. And do you think, a few things I wanna ask here, knowing what we know about people with diabetes has have an increase in polycystic kidney disease and the cysts use glucose to grow. We obviously know in timed fasting and intermittent fasting that and calorie restriction that you're basically making the pancreas work more efficiently and that those insulin receptor sites work more efficiently. So you've got a better utilization of blood glucose and balancing blood sugar levels and things like that. Do they think that that's why they're shrinking because you're basically working on insulin receptors and improving uh, you know, insulin sensitivity and those sort of things? Is, is that one of the mechanisms? So, um, so partly, so part of it they've sort of worked out is to do with the body being in ketosis um, and the production of ketone bodies. So when we don't have, um, you know, a surplus of, of glucose in terms of sort of coming in from the diet, our body then has to switch to make a different sort of, of fuel or energy. And what it does is it switches to breaking down um, to breaking down fat and it makes these things called ketones. And that's sort of where they ended up with the research that it was the presence of, of ketone bodies. Um, and the reason why 
that seem to be beneficial in polycystic kidney disease is partly to do with the fact that they will use glucose, the cysts use glucose for energy and to grow. Um, and also because in polycystic kidney disease, there's a certain signaling pathway that they realized was upregulated or overworking. Um, it's called the mTOR pathway, so mammalian target of rapamycin. And when people go into ketosis, um, that's one way that we can quieten down or dampen down uh, the action of mTOR. So when we're talking about um, medication earlier, um, one of the medications that they've tried to use in, in polycystic kidney disease is rapamycin because it works on the mTOR pathway. Um, and that was super successful in animals. And then they started using it in humans and they weren't just weren't getting the same benefits. And they've realized the reason why is to get the equivalent dose of what they were giving the animals in humans was toxic. Um, and it was creating a lot of other problems. So remember to hit subscribe. So you'll get notified whenever there's some new content on the YouTube channel. And if you haven't already head across to kidneycoach.com. There's an article there that uh, Emily's written on polycystic kidney disease. So take care everybody. And again, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Emily. Appreciate thanks. it. Bye. No worries. Bye.